Mark Crispin Miller is the author of Fooled Again, How the Right Stole the 2004 Election and Why this, They'll Steal the Next One Too, in parentheses, unless we stop them. First off, how was the election stolen? Well, it was stolen through a very broad range of tactics and devices. There were countless frauds at the state level, at the county level, as well as uh, larger frauds, such as, for example, a clearly systematic interference with the votes of Americans abroad. The last chapter of Fooled Again deals with that. Uh, it was, there is no one smoking gun. There was no single method, although the electronic touchscreen voting machines were variously used throughout the nation to uh, uh, cut the Kerry vote and pad the Bush vote. But what's uh, one of the most striking things about what happened last year is the sheer variety, the menu of tricks, uh, many of them taking us back to the good old days of Mayor Daley in Chicago, where I come from. Uh, Democrats and Republicans have been stealing elections for years, but this theft last year, I argue, was, was different in, in scale in technological sophistication, and in the profoundly anti-democratic sentiment behind it. Some of the things that you write about include voter suppression and election day irregularities. Explain what you mean by those terms. Well, voter suppression uh, refers to a whole range of things, uh, but it, it would include uh, systematic efforts to make voter registration difficult or impossible. This happened not only in Ohio, as we all know this stuff went on in Ohio, but it happened in Florida, it happened in Pennsylvania, it really happened nationwide. And it, it's, it's not as uh, uh, sort of dramatic a method as putting on white hoods and going out and frightening people into staying home on election day, but it's actually more effective for that very reason. Uh, it leaves no traces, uh, but it, it does disproportionately affect people only on one side of the political divide. Uh, then you asked about, what was the other thing? Uh, election day irregularities. Oh, election day irregularities were uh, staggering in their diversity. Uh, for example, throughout the nation there was a sort of systematic undersupply of voting machines to democratic regions, not just in Ohio again, but all over the place. Uh, even when they expected a very high turnout, they would be woefully undersupplied with machines. Of the machines they did get, many of them would break down. This didn't happen in Republican districts, so that uh, in the most crowded places where there were the most new voters, often you would have very, very long lines, people having to wait for hours, and then, predictably enough, people having to leave without voting because they had, had work to do or kids to take care of. So uh, that's just one example. The book attempts to give uh, a real overview of all the stuff that went down last year, uh, most of it reported by local media uh, and tuned out, uh, shrugged off by national media, and even at this point, also by the Democrats. I want to make clear to your viewers that I'm not a Democrat. I'm a proud independent. Uh, my politics go back to Tom Paine and Thomas Jefferson. And uh, frankly, considering how the Democratic Party has refused to deal with this crucial issue, the integrity of our electoral system, I'm, I'm a more uh, fervent non-democrat than ever. I want to see at least one of the parties uh, show that they believe in the system that the framers designed for us, and that's fundamentally dependent on the right to vote. Are there any lessons that have been learned either by the, the media, the Democrats or the Republicans that will be carried forth into 2006 and 2008 so that on either side of the political fence, there won't be the accusation that this election was stolen from us by the other side? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. I think that the, the right has learned how to keep doing more of what they've been doing. There are uh, efforts now underway to get the Diebold electronic touchscreen voting machines into uh, so-called blue strongholds like California, New York, uh, Maryland, and uh, because the press and the Democrats refuse to talk about the really serious flaws in those machines, uh, a lot of people are, are not sufficiently aware of the problem to organize against the use of those machines. Uh, so uh, there are also, of course, is a campaign here in Washington 
to weaken uh, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is up for renewal, if that law should be weakened, uh, that will open the door to states like Georgia, which now demand that all voters purchase a state-issued ID before they vote. This amounts to a poll tax. Uh, there's similar legislation is pending in Arizona and in Indiana. If the Voting Rights Act is repealed, uh, these states will be free to, to disenfranchise as many of their citizens as they want. So I'm afraid the lessons that have been learned have been the wrong lessons. Uh, we, we see people, the people who stand to lose the most, shying away from the issue because they're afraid it sounds crazy. We see the media basically ridiculing people who point out well-documented anomalies, well-documented improprieties. Uh, that's not the way the system's supposed to work. I think the right of the people to vote is sacrosanct, and I think that Democrats and Republicans of principle who believe in the system uh, should really pay attention to what happened last year, because if the scandal does not finally resonate, we won't have the movement of media, re uh, sorry, of election reform that we very, very badly need. We're talking about election politics, particularly presidential election politics, with author and professor Mark Crispin Miller, author of Fooled Again. The number's there on the screens if you want to get involved in the conversation. 202-737-0002 if you support the Democrats. 737-0001 uh, if you support President Bush, and 202-628-0205 if you're an independent like our author, Mr. Miller. Our first call comes from Omaha, Nebraska on the Democrats line. Go ahead. Hello. I'm a first-time caller. Uh, I'd like to ask the guest um, if he has, if this is proven through his book and, and he's got the, the data, why is there not more of an outcry from the Democrats and from um, uh, any civil um, um, organization? I mean, why, how could this happen? Well, th that is an excellent question. That's probably the question. How could it happen? The evidence is, is abundant, and it's precise. And uh, people don't have to rely on my book to uh, see that something's very badly wrong. The GAO, Government Accountability Office, which is a completely bipartisan, completely respectable, establishmentarian research agency, came out with a report uh, about a month ago uh, demonstrating quite clearly that the electronic touchscreen machines have serious flaws in them and they're not really safe to use in a democratic system. That's the GAO. There's been abundant other evidence. John Conyers' report on what happened in Ohio, which is available under the title What Went Wrong in Ohio, is a paperback. There's all this evidence. Why isn't there more of an outcry about it? Well, I discussed this with John Kerry three weeks ago and he told me that he believes the race was stolen, but he deplored the fact that his fellow Democrats on the Hill won't discuss it with him. Tried to talk to Christopher Dodd, for example, about the machines. Dodd got annoyed, he got impatient. We looked into this, there's nothing there. We call this denial. Uh, the story got out that I had had this conversation with him about a week later, and he cat categorically denied ever having the exchange with me I'd met with him to give him my book and to urge him to look into this issue. Uh, well, I promise you, it's true. We did have the conversation. Uh, and Teresa Hines Carey has gone publicly, uh, on, has gone on record as saying she believes the race was stolen, or at least she suspects that it was. This is the crucial question. Why are the Democrats afraid to talk about it, Democrats other than John Conyers and a few brave souls? Uh, and why is the media so quick to ridicule the very idea uh, when, you know, stealing elections is in a sense an American pastime, and we've seen that this administration will do just about anything it wants. So uh, I, I would urge all your viewers to, you know, however they get their information about this, whether they read the GAO report or whether they read Fooled Again, uh, whatever they do, they must pressure their elected representatives and the media in their area to look into this, stop sweeping it under the rug, it's too important uh, to allow this thing to continue. Houston, Texas, go ahead. Uh, yeah, let me first thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, it's a really uh, great service you do. Uh, I, I have to wonder what fantasy world your guest is uh, living in, if he has even read the American Center for Voting Rights Legislative Fund report of 2005. Uh, 
which reported that while Democrats routinely accused Republicans of voter intimidation and suppression, that neither party had a clean record, and the evidence shows that Democrats waged an aggressive uh, suppression campaign against Republican voters in 2004. Uh, and some examples they give are paid Democrat operatives charged with slashing tires and of 25 uh, get-out-the-vote vans in Milwaukee, misleading telephone calls made by Democrat operatives operating in telephone voters in Ohio with the wrong date for the election, intimidating and deceiving ma mailings and telephone calls paid for by the DNC threatening Republican volunteers in Florida with legal action, union-coordinated intimidation, violence, uh, campaign targeted at Republican campaign offices and volunteers, resulting in a broken arm for a GOP volunteer in Florida. Uh, it goes on and on, uh, documenting uh, evidence of, of uh, widespread Democrat fraud, and uh, it's just uh, it's it's just ludicrous. Sir, well, I know that report very well. Uh, the American Center for Voting Rights is a Republican front group that uh, represents itself as bipartisan. This is a very old trick. If people want the details on the American Center for Voting Rights, I posted a lot of information about it on my website, uh, markcrispinmiller.com. The fact is it's run by uh, what we have, party operatives, party lawyers, and they have a guy, I think his name is Brian Lund, who is ostensibly a Democrat, but he's been a very pro-Bush Democrat for a while. Almost all of the instances your caller mentioned in the report uh, are actually far more typical of the Republicans. They made robocalls throughout the nation, giving people the wrong date for Election Day. The Democrats would have nothing to gain from doing that. Uh, the one instance he mentions of the tire slashing, it was not paid operatives who slashed those tires in Milwaukee. It was actually the son of a Democratic candidate. Right. Deplorable, you know, anything like that I think is deplorable. But the important point is this, uh, the Republicans have to resort to this kind of propaganda in order to cloud the issue. Because while there were cases of, of individuals, kind of, uh, you might say a kind of retail level uh, vote fraud, people basically trying to make more money, they'd be hired to register new Democrats so they would make up names. They'd register Mickey Mouse and Princess Grace of Monaco, you know, because they wanted the four bucks for that extra vote. That's corruption. That happens. It's deplorable. Whenever the instances were discovered, the people were fired. It wasn't done by the party itself. The wholesale kind of fraud, the systemic fraud, the fraud involving secretaries of state who also co-chair presidential campaigns in their state, fiddling with the laws, with the rules, making the rules deliberately confusing. The fact is that the Republican Party engaged in systemic collective acts of fraud compared to which the Democratic fraud was insignificant. To compare the two is like, you know, comparing a pickpocket ring to, to the Cosa Nostra. Our next call comes from Newtown, Connecticut, on our others line for Mark Crispin Miller. Good morning. Uh, thank you for C-SPAN, and good morning, Mr. Miller, and thank you for bringing up this important subject. I was very interested to hear what you said about Senator Dodd, since he is my senator, and I was struck by seeing this subject this morning because in my own town, all of the voting machines are being replaced uh, this year uh, un under a very tight deadline. Uh, our registrar of voters uh, have had to go and choose an electronic voting machine. Uh, I guess the, 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 the logic of this uh, is dictated by the Help America Vote Act, which says that if, if there's any machine that can't be used by a handicapped person, then all the machines have to be changed. And I've just been watching this process unfold here in, in our own town with great concern because I think people have to keep in mind that with electronic voting, for instance, in, in Florida and apparently in Ohio, if, if, if a vote gets stolen anywhere in this country, enough to tip a race, then it's, it's your vote that's being stolen anywhere. My vote, I feel, was stolen, even though in our state, I feel the election was run fairly in 2000. But now uh, these electronic voting machines apparently will be the only thing available to us. Uh, after so many years of, of using the previous system. And I guess I just wanted to ask uh, if you had heard anything about the company that turns out we'll probably be using in this town, which is Danaher, Danaher that's D-A-N-A-H-E-R. Uh, perhaps some of these units are trustworthy, but, you know, thank God we're not getting a, a, a Diebold unit. Um, is, is there anything that, that we can do uh, 
to um, petition this, this mass movement towards electronic voting machines, because that seems to me the greatest threat. And do you think the Danaher machine is subject to the same type of tampering? I will take the answer offline. Thank you very much. Thank you for that call. Um, I, I'm, I'm not expert on Danaher, but I can make a, a general statement on the, the, uh, the state of electronic voting machines in general. They're bug-ridden. They're made by private vendors that will not reveal their programming codes. Therefore, to allow any of these companies to count the vote, assuring us that we should trust them, that they will definitely give us the correct numbers, is exactly like allowing the management of the company to take the votes on election day into their homes, pull the blinds, lock the doors, come out the next morning and say, okay, here, here's your results, P trust us. It is exactly tantamount to a secret vote count. Uh, now, it is completely feasible to me that there could be a system designed that's somehow tamper-proof. I strongly doubt it. I think that any computer-based system is questionable. The Help America Vote Act does not directly mandate the use of touchscreen machines, but as the caller correctly said, it mandates the use of whatever uh, uh, me machines will make it easiest for the disabled to vote. And it provides money, lots and lots of money, to places that will buy such machinery. The biggest players in this game, Diebold, ESNS, and Sequoia, are all private vendors. Their management and, and owners are all closely connected to the Republican Party. If, if it were the case that they were all closely connected to the Democratic Party, I would still be sitting here talking to you and complaining about it, because that has no place in our system. So. The answer, the answer to his specific question is, uh, go to votersunite.org. Votersunite.org uh, has a kind of daily listing of all articles and developments and groups and so on. Everything that pertains to election theft and see what's going on in, in Connecticut. There have been local efforts in certain states to, to fight the use of these machines. These efforts are sometimes successful. So uh, please do look into that, and I, I wish you... I wish you well. Is it possible that the Democrats have not thrown up any kind of hue and cry with regard to um, alleged ir irregularities in the 2004 election because they don't want to have to admit that the Republicans are better at dirty tricks than they are? I never heard that explanation before. Uh, that's, I suppose that's possible, but I think it's something, it's something more uh, irrational than that. I, th I think they're basically frightened of seeming uh, fringy, of seeming to be way, way out there. And I also think, frankly, that there's an element of denial. I think the implications of what went down last year are extremely frightening. I mean, what this suggests to us is that we're not really living in a functioning democracy. What it suggests to us is that we got one party basically in control of the government and it will play by its own rules and doesn't really regard itself as accountable to the electorate because it has a way to get around the electorate. Those are difficult things to take in, especially for people inside the system here in Washington. People like Kerry, like Dodd, who are materially and emotionally invested in the status quo. They don't want to go where this will have to take them. So I think it's, it, 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 it's very human that people have preferred to shrug it off but I think it's also ir irresponsible. On Alaska, Wisconsin, go ahead. Hello, I've been waiting a while, and good morning, and so I hope you let me finish what I have to say. Well, first of all, your guest, I don't know if he just really likes spy movies and James Bond and those types of conspiracies or what, what his problem is. Um, but it seems to me that this talk about somehow another, I'm black, and this talk about that, we black people are, are afraid and we can be easily intimidated we're not living in america 1930 we're not running around here intimidated by white people that's just a lie and second of all it seems to me that if the democrats win constantly then there is no fraud only if the republicans win as if uh, the only way that it can be fair is if the democrats are winning and so you know your whole argument is just it's, it's, it's pathetic you're pathetic. It's just a just pathetic situation. You just need to get away from your conspiracy theory movies and try to, you know, look into reality a little more. Mr. Miller? 
I looked into to reality long and hard, and I found abundant evidence of systematic efforts to intimidate black voters and Hispanic voters and Native American voters all over the country. The, the sources are there. I have page upon page of footnotes. I'm an extremely meticulous scholar. And I think this was a valuable call because it demonstrates the kind of argument I tend to come up against. Uh, this woman hasn't read the book. This woman has some vague ideas about how swell everything is today. Uh, well, she should get out more, frankly. She should certainly read the book. She can take it out of the library. Uh, but, but what's most striking here is the kind of personal attack on me. I'm pathetic. Or I may be pathetic, okay? But the fact is the book is, is solidly argued and well evidenced. So um, the question I would have for her, it's rhetorical, is uh, you know, why, why, does this, why does this so anger you? Why do you feel it necessary to insult me? Give me a specific example that you would find in the book that um, would, would support your point that blacks, minority, uh, Latinos, and other minorities were targeted um, to try and steer them away or to try and have their votes not counted in the last oh, sure. election. Well, I mean, all over the country, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, all throughout the South, uh, in black areas, black cities, for example, uh, there, there was a, a, a startling array of intimidation tactics used and uh, disinformation deployed to keep people from getting to the polls on the right day, in the right place. Uh, people were systematically threatened with arrest if they showed up to vote with so much as an unpaid parking ticket or if they had a relative who was behind in child support payments. This went on all over the place. And if people want to go to the original source of much of the evidence, they, they need only consult the ele Election Incident Reporting System, that's E-I-R-S, that's online. So if you want to know what happened, say, in New Orleans before, uh, uh, on, the, on Election Day, you can go type in E-I-R-S, do a Google search on E-I-R-S and New Orleans, and you'll get a full catalog of the calls that were uh, made that day by people who had been personally prevented from voting, personally intimidated, uh, personally misinformed. This went on, uh, you know, on such a scale and in, in, in so many places that were primarily African American, Hispanic American, Native American, also in student neighborhoods, college towns. It, you, you would really have to be more than naive to decide that it was accidental. Our next call comes from Washington, D.C. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, what, one thing I'd like to actually agree with you, actually being an African American from New Orleans and having to have my driver's license checked by a police officer before I voted, that a lot of things did go along um, that was wrong. When and you were waiting in line, sir, before I, you uh, ask your question, when you were waiting in line, did you notice whether or not the police officers were checking the driver's licenses of white voters? No, they weren't. They had poll volunteers that were actually checking theirs that were regular citizens that were there, or elderly. But when a black person would walk into the polling person, the police officer would come up and say, can I see your ID? Okay. And Go this, ahead. With this went on with uh, it, it, black colleges in Texas and Alabama and South Carolina. It went on all over the place. And uh, it's, it's simply a denial of reality to say otherwise. This man's experience is typical. Baltimore, Maryland, you're on the Washington Journal. Wow, more. Um, just to make a comment, um, I think, Mr. Miller, you're, you're, you're a fraud and a phony, and I don't mean to call you names, but I just want to, you know, that's my opinion. Um, I'm, I'm from Baltimore. Uh, years ago, I was involved in politics. I'm a registered Democrat. I've uh, been a Democrat all my life because you basically have no power in the Baltimore area unless you are a Democrat. I'm from the Italian community. I used to vote 10, 15 times as a Democrat. Talk about voter fraud. It happens in Chicago, it happens in Baltimore, it happens in all major cities where the Democrats win all the time. Talk about fraud. I switch parties because of that. Now, I come from a family background where it was, you know, it, talk about, I, I just, uh, to me, I just can't get over how, um, how twisted your thinking is and your book is. Not that I read your book, I wouldn't read your book. But I'm telling you, the fraud is in the Democratic Party, and it's amazing how the Democrats accuse Republicans of that which they do constantly. Well, um, 
I hope he believes what I say in reply. <laughs> um, sure, there's been fraud for a long time uh, in various democratic cities. I, I think I said at the beginning of the show that there's been election fraud on both sides for a very long time. He's right about Baltimore. He's right about Chicago. I'm from Chicago, so I know this. That's neither here nor there. Uh, the fact that it does go on and has gone on certainly doesn't mean it only goes on or only has gone on among the Democrats. The fact that it has gone on among the Democrats doesn't mean that in the last election there was not systematic collective fraud committed by the Republicans. As I said before, some of Mayor Daley's tactics from Chicago that I recognized from when I was a teenager have, were used in this last election, uh, often involving the uh, sort of strategic use of certain party members to pose as members of the other party. This is how Mayor Daley got around the rule that there had to be a bipartisan panel of election judges in every, in every ward. So they were all actually Democrats. Some of them called themselves Republicans. I've received other calls like this gentleman's call, similarly abusive and um, similarly uh, claiming that uh, I'm a Democrat and I saw this happen so much I had to change parties. I mean, I may be a fraud and a phony. I would submit that this guy could be a fraud and a phony too, uh, just like the American Center for Voting Rights is a, is a fraud. We've got this item from Reuters, which actually came out on Tuesday from Kansas City. The U.S. Justice Department has sued Missouri, a swing state won easily by President George W. Bush, for voting violations in the 2004 election, including registering more people to vote in some counties than their entire voting age population. The complaint filed on Tuesday in the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Missouri said 29 Missouri counties and election jurisdictions had more people registered to vote than their actual were people of voting age living in those areas. If this works its way through the, the criminal justice system, uh, and I don't know if it would be something that, that would end up in the uh, Supreme Court, is it possible that they would have to do the election all over again? Or, or are we pretty much stuck with the, uh, not stuck, but do we just live with the results the way they are and try and do things differently in 2008? Well, there's nothing in the Constitution that can guide us here. This is, this is virgin territory. So I think we'd be pretty much on our own and trying to figure out what to do. I tend not to think that the results of the 2004 election can be reversed because there's nothing in the Constitution to allow us to do that. Your idea of a, of a, of a new election is an intriguing one. And I suppose if, if Bush's fortunes continue to decline, some people may suggest that. But I think it's unlikely. I think that our focus should be on the future. I think that we, we should be uh, talking very seriously about a national movement of election reform, uh, which will concern the use of paper ballots. I think we should return to paper ballots. I think we should ban the participation of private vendors in our election system. There is no reason for that. It's something you shouldn't have in a democracy. I think we should start to talk about a rational system for elections, a federal system with a uniform standard from state to state and county to county run by a completely nonpartisan bureaucracy whose job is to make sure the elections take place fairly and that the count is conducted accurately. If you put the election in the hands of a federal entity, though, don't you open yourself up to accusations that it's going to be run or influenced by the party in power, either in the White House or in the Congress? Well, one could run into those accusations. I, I actually think the system we have now is run by the party in power, you see? Uh, there are agencies in the government that, that are scrupulously nonpartisan. It may seem unbelievable to most of the people watching this show, but the GAO, for example, is, is solidly bipartisan, objective. It does its job. It takes research projects and c it carries them out. Uh, NASA, for example. It's, what's that got to do with party politics? At its best, the post office, which is sometimes, you know, inefficient, but it, I don't believe it's engaged a whole lot lately in distinctly partisan maneuvering. So I, I think that if we, want, if we want to have elections that really work, where people get to vote and the votes are counted, and, and systems that are transparent, so that finally neither party can say, oh, you cheated, oh, you cheated. Because people, they'll always accuse each other of having cheated. That's a fact of life. But we can have a system that is more accessible to the public, one that's actually controlled by the people, who can see what's going on, who can see the count and everything. If you do that, you know, you're going to have as close to fair as you can get.
In addition to being an author, Mark Crispin Miller is also a professor of media studies at New York University and a regular commentator on Air America, appearing often on the Morning Sedition and the Al Franken Show. Our next call comes from New Alm, Minnesota. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, I don't want to apologize for my voice. I got a bad cold. It's okay. Um, uh, just one comment that I wasn't going to make about the previous caller from Baltimore. Um, I was born and raised there. I moved to Minnesota 10 years ago. And, you know, he may be right that, uh, that uh, some, uh, some people in wards vote 10 times, but it, it's absurd. Anybody that knows anything about uh, urban politics, Baltimore politics, the, uh, the Democrats routinely carry there in, uh, in inner city areas and in, in, in urban areas, you know, on the range of 70, 30, um, an extra 10 votes, an extra, you know, extra 10,000 votes doesn't make, makes no difference. So the guy's argument was kind of absurd. But, um, my question is, uh, in 2000, um, uh, in Florida, uh, I believe that the, that the, the, the thing that tipped that election uh, happened way before the election even went on, and that was there was a computer program that uh, the the state of Florida um, obtained uh, to eliminate um, felons from voting, and they were given a choice of um, you know how um, how exact they wanted to be. Um, you know, the more exact they were as far as names and addresses, the the less people would be. Uh, taken off the voting rolls, you know, the less exact they were, the more people would be taken off, and they, of course, chose the the um, the less exact way. And so there were m many, many people, many more than than hanging chads or anything else, that were just disqualified right off the bat, with obviously not enough time on election day. If you show up and they say, "Hey, you're a felon," and you say, "Hey, I'm not," um, you, you know, you have no way to appeal that and get your vote back. And I'm wondering if, um, uh, if Mr. Miller is aware of that program and if those kind of things uh, were used in other states in 2004. Great question. Uh, it was over 90,000 people who were disenfranchised under that program, and I think maybe 2,000 of them had been felons. So it was, it was clearly a disgrace, and it was a big embarrassment for the Bush regime in Florida. I tell the whole story in, in Fooled Again. Uh, the fact is that the felon list for all of the controversy that it, that it roused and all the promises to make sure it would never happen again. Basically, it was used again in 2004. I tell the whole story in great detail. In fact, the section on Florida in the book is the longest and most detailed of any because the stuff that happened, and Florida was a carnival of disenfranchisement. It was staggering. But yeah, the, the, the felon list was one way to do it. You know, it just strikes me sitting here uh, the guy from Baltimore arguing that, uh, you know, he, he voted 10 or 15 times, and then this, this man making the very reasonable point that that was unnecessary in, in, in Baltimore because, you know, the population is democratic. This is really what this is all about. The Democrats uh, didn't uh, commit systemic fraud this last time, not because they're morally superior beings, but because they didn't need to. Uh, and it primarily had to do not with the brilliance of Kerry's campaign, because it was quite an ineptly run campaign. It had to do with this nation's rejection of Bush Cheney's extremist agenda, which, you know, you wouldn't know it from the media, but which had turned off a considerable number of Republicans. I have many pages in the book devoted to the strenuous Republican backlash against Bush before Election Day. A lot of moderate Republicans, a lot of libertarian Republicans who were uneasy with the sort of theocratic drift of Bush's wing of the party, voted, uh, e either sat out the election or, or perhaps voted for Kerry. Uh, it's important for us to, to, to bear this in mind. So the point here is that when people argue so vehemently that the Democrats do it too, wh what they're really saying is that in those places where there are mostly Democrats, something has to be done to keep these people from voting. What they're really objecting to is not that the Democrats committed fraud. What they're really objecting to is the mere existence of large groups of people on the other side. It, it is a very, very dangerous attitude, and to call it intolerant is an understatement, but that's what we're dealing with here, and that explains the vehemence with which the people who carried out this crusade did their work 
of obstructing voters, misinforming voters, bullying voters, because it did happen all over the country. You say it happened all over the country, but a lot of attention was focused on Ohio. And my question is, was Ohio that much more of a, a, an election anomaly than any other parts of the country? Or did they feel like the, the people who run the elections, well, we can't get caught doing this again in Florida, so we've got to do it somewhere else. Is there another Florida or another Ohio on the horizon in 2008? Well, actually there were three states that were the focus or the object of a concerted attack on democratic propriety. The three swing states were Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And I have a lot of information on all three in, in Fooled Again. Uh, so it really wasn't the case that Ohio was the state where it happened. What happened in Florida was equally as, as staggering. But for demographic reasons, for, the, for having to do with electoral votes and so on, we paid particular attention to Ohio. Ohio seems to have put Bush over the top. So the horse race kind of ended up there. But that, that's a, that forces us not to notice uh, how it happened in places like Texas, how it happened in places like Michigan and Wisconsin and so on. Uh, it happened all over the place and we've got to stop thinking that there has to be a ground zero because it even happened in New York. It even happened in New Jersey. It happened in red states where you'd think Bush's victory would be sufficient. But in North Carolina, for example, uh, where Bush was supposed to win by around nine points, in those places uh, f f largely democratic that used the touchscreen machines, he had a 15-point lead, see? And Kerry's lead in Wisconsin was surprisingly small. It was only 12,000 votes. It ought to have been much larger. So we can't simply look in all the usual places. We can't think in all the usual ways. And above all, we can't make the fatal mistake of thinking that it can't happen here. The framers understood that it can happen here. That's why they designed a system with checks and balances. So if they understood it, and we believe in their system, we are obligated not to make that lazy mistake of thinking, nah, not here. This isn't Guatemala. Because it can happen anywhere. Power is that way. And we are obliged in our civilian lives as in our military careers to defend American democracy in every way at hand. Nanuit, New York. Go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Miller. My question goes back to your um, statement about the voting machines and the lack of them and the lack of working machines in certain democratic areas. Right. Isn't Who's got the responsibility to choose the type and choose the number? Is, wouldn't that be the, the, the party that is in power in that particular district in that particular small area that would choose the type and the number of machines for their voting uh, places? Well, ultimately, yes. Uh, in Ohio, for example, this is a state, you know, about which we have a lot of detailed information. Uh, ultimately, it was the Secretary of State who made the decision to hold back uh, voting machines from those neighborhoods that really needed them. Uh, and by and large, it would be the Secretaries of State who were responsible, although in some states at the county level you had people making decisions that were not necessarily approved by the secretaries of state. So it's, I don't mean to paint the, the situation with a broad brush, but whoever is in authority is in the best position to determine how machines are going to be allocated. Yonkers, New York. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. I actually, I was, my comment was um, going to be sort of along the lines of uh, that I agree um, with what you're saying and that this, the government of this country was based on a system of checks and balances and not being able to talk about something like um, problems with um, voting machines and who's going to control them or whether there's corruption at some of them, um, we should at least be able to discuss that in the country. Um, but I did have one quick question just about something you said. Um, you used the term Bush regime and I was wondering why you why you said that? Yeah, I used the word regime. Maybe it's too provocative, but I don't really regard this administration as functioning uh, within American political tradition. I, I don't really think that it, it's, it's recognizably American. I don't think it's conservative. It's not a conservative administration. It's not about limiting the power and size of federal government. It's not about fiscal prudence. 
It's not about refusing to meddle in the affairs of other countries. I mean, by any sort of classical definition of uh, conservatism, any of the criteria of conservatism, this administration is not conservative. So I say regime because I think that it isn't indeed a regime. I, I believe it's, it's here illegitimately. I believe there's far too little political opposition. I think there's a climate of fear that uh, prevents people from speaking out on certain truths. I think our rights are seriously at risk, as they would be under a non-democratic regime. And so I, I, you know, I was quite consciously using that, that term. Huntsville, Alabama, go ahead. Uh, thank you, and good morning, Mr. Crispin. I have, I mean, Mr. Miller, I have not read your book, uh, Fooled Again, but one of the concerns I had in the last election, and uh, it's a big concern, is that there was a Democratic um, governor and several others, the governor of Pennsylvania, who tried very hard to keep out the military vote, the absentee ballots. And I wonder if you had anything to say in your program about that, because that was not a Republican attempt. That was mostly Democrat from what I could see. So what um, information do you have in your book on absentee military votes being um, try for people trying to eliminate that from our process? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd like you to go to my, my blog at markcrispinmiller.com and post a comment giving me the details on that because I had actually never heard that there were Democratic governors trying to suppress the military vote. Uh, because if it's true, I'll certainly put it in the next edition of the book. I do have a lot of information about the military vote in Fooled Again. And uh, what I've discovered is that uh, a considerable number of the troops abroad actually favored Kerry according to an Annenberg School poll on October 15th, just before Election Day, it found that a third of, of uniformed servicemen uh, supported Kerry and it tended to be enlisted men, whereas it tended to be the officers who supported the administration. Uh, there, in fact, were various efforts that I describe in the book to kind of police the military vote. Overall, there was an effort, as I said before, to subvert the whole uh, expatriate vote, the whole vote, the whole, uh, the whole vote cast by those who live outside the country, which includes the military. So um, I have not seen any evidence of actual efforts to suppress the military vote. I've heard a lot of Republican charges that this went on. But um, if you'll be kind enough to give me the information, I'll certainly take it seriously. The book is Fooled Again, How the Right Stole the 2004 Election and Why They'll Steal the Next One, Too. Its author, Mark Crispin Miller. Thank you very much for being on the program. Thanks for having me. We are going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be taking a look at the uh, cover story in this week's Weekly Standard. All in the Family, Money, Mobsters, Murder, the Sordid Tale of a GOP Lobbyist Casino Deal Gone Bad, and its author, Matthew Continetti.